So, welcome to this new lecture on the course uh, functional genomics. In the previous lecture, we have looked into how genes can be uh, knocked out, meaning mutated in animal models like mouse, uh, wherein we discussed uh, how a specific region of the gene can be deleted. Uh, therefore, you can understand the function of the gene in the organism per se. But uh, you know, although this is a very, very powerful. Uh, technique to understand the gene function, this approach has its own limitation and that is true for any approach. Uh, it has its own merits and um, some undesirable uh, 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 characteristics for which we have to overcome with some other approach. For example, when you go for a global knockout of a gene wherein you wish to delete the gene in all the cells of an organism if the organism can survive and you will be able to see the phenotype. But that at times you know uh, there are challenges for example, um, you know when you, when you knock out a gene that embryonic development itself is compromised therefore, you will never see an animal coming out, out of birth. Therefore, people have developed a new approach called conditional knockout meaning you delete the gene only in a group of cell or a tissue or when you want the gene to be deleted. Not right from the word go. And that is what highlighted in this slide here that restricting the mutation of a particular to a particular tissue if you can restrict that then probably you know you will be able to decipher the function of a given gene in a given tissue. So, that really helps because it is not that all the genes are you know the function is restricted to given tissue. So, it may be working in several tissue. So, when you knock out the phenotype that you see end phenotype you really do not know uh, you know is resulting from a defect in a particular system or tissue or is it you know an effect of uh, a compromise in multiple organs and tissue systems and so on. So, genes that have more than one function and uh, at more than one stage for example, they could have function in development and after that once the animal becomes adult they may have some specialized function. So, if you really want to understand how the gene contribute to these too distinct for example, phase of development, then you want to restrict the mutation to a certain developmental stage or to a certain tissue. So, that is the global knockdown that we discussed in the last class. You know if it becomes you know a gene is so critical that the embryo dies. So, that will not really help us to understand the function of the gene in the adult because you lost the embryo because it only tells you that it is critical for the development, but it does not tell you as to what is the function of the gene in the adult or in a given tissue and so on. So, the approach is to inactivate the gene in a given tissue and not in the embryonic stem cells like we discussed. If you recall the discussion, we said that we will introduce the cassette, knockdown cassette into the embryonic stem cells and the gene is deleted and you are going to use this embryonic stem cells to create the embryo chimeras and then and then eventually you will get the global knockdown. So, that that you know if it is embryonic lethal if the embryo does not survive or if it has a problem with reproduction, then you are not going to see um, that phenotype in successive generations. So, you would even lose the line that you have created. So, if you can restrict you know the mutation to a specific tissue or a mutation happening only at a later stage of development or when you want that, then it helps you to dissect the gene function in all the tissues that gene express in different development stage and so on. So, that is where you have the you know a next generation of knockout approach which is called as conditional knockout that really helps us to dissect the function of the gene. Let us see what is the difference between the global knockout that we discussed uh, as compared to the restricted what you call as a conditional knock, knockout approach. The difference comes in the way you create the cassette the DNA vector that you use to knock out the particular gene. So, the difference here you, as you can see here. So, you can see that in a global knockout what you do is that you take the flanking region of a gene um, or a segment of a gene which you want to disrupt you want to knock out. So, what here what we do in this kind of conditional knockout you really do not delete 
that you know the segment that you want to be deleted in the cassette itself in the targeting cassette itself, but rather you introduce some new sites. So, that is what is shown here in the green color you can see here on either side of it. So, these are x 1, 1, 2 and 3 and then you want to delete if you your aim is to remove all these 3 exons of a gene. Therefore, um, uh, you know you, you, you sort of understand the function of the gene because it is lost its function. What you do is whichever region that you wish to delete on either side of it, you add a small sequence which is called a lock species. So, you can go to the literature and found what it is, is small sequences and these are the sequence that are identified by a recombinase which is bacterial in origin and this recombinase what it does is it promotes what is called a site specific recombination meaning when there are sites um, in adjacent segment of you know in cis meaning in the same DNA the recombinase will identify these sites and whatever is in between these two sites it will be deleted and the DNA fragment um, you know uh, that is removed. Now, that region gets filled in so therefore, the genome is restored, but you have lost the segment. For example, between this site and this site you know whatever is in between that will be lost because of the recombinase. <coughs> so, you have to have in to generate the conditional knockout first you create a targeting vector in which you are able to you know put uh, introduce the lock space sites on the region within which you want to delete the gene. So, for example, here you have added lock space sites in the cassette and then the procedure is same. So, you introduce this inside embryonic stem cells, you go for a positive selection or negative selection and make the animal and so on. But as long as the lock space sites are there in the intronic region for example, in this gene that is how it is shown these are very small sequence that are normally do not affect the function of the gene. So, in other words even if you have introduced lock space sites and the gene is functional because it may be the sites are there in the intron. So, when the RNA is being made it is spliced out it does not really affect the function. So, by creating an animal which has this lock space sites uh, on either side of a gene segment which you want to delete this animal is normal because it is normally it is functional. So, when would you delete the gene because that is the beauty of the system. So, you can condition it meaning you can restrict the deletion happening only in certain tissue or a particular developmental stage as you wish. Okay. So, for that to happen you have to have the protein what you call as a Cray recombinase. Okay. This is as I told you this is our bacterial origin. So, it is not normally expressed in, in mouse and rat and whichever organism at least you are trying to uh, create a conditional mutant. Therefore, what you need is you need to have a transgenic animal meaning an animal which is expressing a foreign gene therefore, it is protein that is required. In this case it is a transgenic uh, animal which expresses the Cray recombinase. Okay? So, that is what is shown here. So, now what transgene you would use or which transgenic line you would use it all depends on your, your plan like where do you want to delete the gene. For example, what is shown here is a Cray recombinase this is the coding sequence of the Cray recombinase and you have you know linked that coding sequence to a promoter of a gene which is normally expressed in astrocytes. These are a specialized uh, group of cells that are present only in the central nervous system say in the brain. These are not neurons, these are non neuronal tissues but restricted to nervous system. Now, what is unique about this is that since you have you know driving this Cray recombinase coding sequence under a promoter of a gene that is normally expressed in astrocytes. So, if you know the Cray recombinase is expressed in the cell only in those cells your knock down or knockout will take place. For example, when you cross these two animals the one that has the lock species sites with the animal that carrying the recombinase when you when you get this hybrid which has got both. Now, in this animal you know in astrocytes this differentiated cells you would have Cray recombinase therefore, the knockout or the gene will be deleted only in these cells in other tissue for example, digest system or even the neuron or during development this gene is absolutely normal therefore, you do not see any uh, you know defect. So, whatever the effect that you are going to see now is because of the loss of the gene in astrocytes that with, with confidence you can say that. Now, say suppose this gene is also expressed in intestine for example, the whatever gene that you want to delete. So, how would you uh, test the function of the gene in intestine? So, again you have to have a transgenic animal in which 
the Cre recombinase is expressing in the you know cells that are there in the intestine. So, if you do that you are going to delete the gene in intestine or in testis or in ovary or in lung. So, it all depends now once you have created a conditional knockout animal wherein the lock species sites are inserted on either side of the gene. Now, it all uh, depends on you with uh, which you know uh, the transgenic animal that express Cre recombinase you are crossing. So, you can choose the uh, you know transgenic animal that express Cre recombinase and then whichever desired cell you will be able to delete. So, that is called as you know conditional knockout. So, for example, here what happens is when you have Cre recombinase it is going to go and identify those two lock species sites and then introduce what is called as a site specific recombination. So, what happens in this case is the recombinase you know you have this is your DNA and you have lock species sites here. The re re recombinase actually helps in bringing these two sites together that it can do by something like this. So, you have this site, this site came together and the recombinase sits here and basically cuts the DNA and here and here. Therefore, you have a linear DNA in which the recombinase cut exactly the lock species sites and introduced. Then you would probably have a circular DNA which has a recombinase site, this lock species site, but this will not survive because it is not going to have replication origin, it is not going to have telomere, it is not going to have centromere. So, within a few you know division it would be lost, so it is not functional, but this is part of your chromosomal DNA. But whatever DNA element that was part of the gene that was present in between is deleted. So, in this way you are able to delete the gene you know by driving the recombinase in whichever tissue you want to do this. In fact, the technique is so robust that you can nowadays you can pretty much you know uh, decide when do you want to delete the gene. For example, this there are uh, drugs that are available when you feed the animal with the drug a given gene may be turned on. So, assume that you know the Cre recombinase is under a promoter which is you know whose expression you can um, sort of tune from uh, you know what you are feeding to the animal. So, in this way you can decide as to when you can induce the Cre recombinase and, and you can shut down the gene. So, this is a powerful technique and people are now trying to understand for example, during aging process or a, a good disease model you know whether you know you will be able to bring in some therapeutic approach all these are being tested by creating such kind of animals. So, that is a very very powerful tool. So, I will give you one such example where um, you know there are uh, advancements that really helped us to understand the human disease using this kind of conditional um, knockout models. For example, one of the very very common neuro neurological disorders is known as Rett syndrome. The Rett syndrome is um, you know in human it is a mental retardation and uh, it is known that it is uh, you know it is X linked and so on. But what is amazing is that there are not many uh, male patients that were known to have Rett syndrome. So, there were um, the theories that either it is they do not survive or it does not affect the male it is a very milder phenotype and so on. And what is when they identified the gene for this Rett syndrome then what they found was very surprising because the gene that is mutated and leading to the Rett syndrome phenotype is a protein that is expressed in a wide variety of cells. In fact, it is ubiquitous meaning it is expressed in every cell type that you can think of and second it has a very very generic function at least from functional point of view because this is a protein that goes and binds to um, uh, regions in the genome which are uh, methylated uh, cytosine bases these are called as this CPG islands which are normally present in the promoter region of many genes when the cytosine in such CPG phosph that is P stands for the phosphate when you have such methylation then more often these genes are marked for you know kind of a silencing meaning it should not express and so on. So, this is considered to be a transcriptional factor which identify such sequence and modulate the gene expression and is expressed in variety of tissues and CPG myth methylation is known in all the tissue types. So, they never it was a surprise when they found that this is the gene that is causing the red syndrome because it is a purely a neurological phenotype I mean otherwise you do not have any problem except that these uh, kids are mentally retarded 
their IQ level is very low and so on. So, this was a surprise. So, then they would like to really dis dissect how this gene may cause a neurological phenotype though the gene is expressed in wide variety of tissues. It is expressed in neurons in the nervous system, it is also expressed in the non neuronal cells in the nervous system and there was one study before that where they have knocked out the gene in you know in a mouse and then the embryo did not survive even you know for embryonic growth this particular gene was you know considered to be very very essential. So, they went ahead and used this particular model conditional model wherein they have driven the Cree recombinase under a promoter of a gene which is normally expressed in a differentiated neuron. Okay. So, therefore, once then you know the animal is uh, you know sort of grown and have a differentiated neurons you know you will not have the Cree recombinase, but the moment the neurons differentiate the Cree recombinase would express because it is under a control of a gene which is normally expressed in a differentiated neuron. So, now the recombinase would go and introduce the deletion because you know, otherwise the log p sites are normal it, it allows the gene to perform function, but once you have the Cree recombinase it sort of results in the uh, deletion of the segment of the DNA that are between the two log p sites as a result these neurons now lost this particular protein and then they looked at the phenotype of the G the mouse they have understood as to what goes wrong in such condition therefore, you have a mental retardation phenotype and now in fact this animal model is being used for you know screening drug and there are very beautiful you know um, studies which have identified drug molecules that are under clinical trial. So, that really talks about how powerful these kind of approaches in understanding the disease process and that can be translated for the human. So, you can see here uh, what we are talking about is um, the brain weight because you know often you must have seen when the baby is born one of the physical examination that is done normally every once in 6 months is to look into the size of the head, so, head circumference they normally measure because that is an indicator as to whether the baby is growing normally or not. Normally the patient that the, the kids that have suffered from neurological phenotype the circumference could be you know somewhat smaller or lower than what you see in the normal population. So, this is a study which really dissected and showed that you know that when, when you lose this protein only in the neuron you know you have a phenotype the symptoms that are very similar to what you see in the in the in the human condition. So, that you know otherwise you know you are unable to study this because we knock out in every cell the embryo dies then you are not having a model to study in the adult. So, this really helps us. So, likewise there are number of studies people have used this model to understand the function of the protein. Now, that is one model, but what you need to understand is that um, creating a trans you know knockout construct uh, is a very very tedious process because you know it requires manipulating the genome and creating a construct and things like that. So, it is really you know time consuming and 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 uh, probably it is quite good in case of uh, uh, models where you are able to uh, have the genome sequenced and you know the genome um, what you call as uh, the structure of all the genes are known and so on, but it is not kind of universal you can apply to everything it has its own limitations. So, therefore, in parallel there are many other approaches that are being tried out. Now, one of the approaches uh, that is getting much more attention these days because of its uh, more precise control as to what can be done. In fact, what we are talking about in gene targeting or conditional knockout is that you are able to create a mutation, but you know the technology that are coming now is can you sort of correct uh, an error that is there that is re resulting in a disease right. So, if you can fix that probably that individual can become normal. So, therefore, there are many other approaches in the meantime people are trying to um, engineer the genome to either understand the disease process or understand the gene function and one of the promising approaches um, that is being considered to be much more powerful than the log p system or global knockout is called as genome editing right using certain engineered nucleases right. So, this is just this cartoon gives you an overall view as to what it it, it's a, it has a wide applicability people you used it in plant cell in fact, it started. Uh, to begin with for the plants now it is being applied even to the human I will talk about a little later. So, it is basically uh, what you have is you have a, a, a engineered nuclease um, that 
can identify a given segment, a small region of the genome and then it can cut there and then the our own cellular machinery has a repair mechanism right. If you have any damage in a DNA or a repair mechanism tries to um, you know fix that and it is in this it is expected that our repair mechanism would you know try to fix that damage caused by the engineering nucleus. In this process there may be some changes that is happening. So, there are two different process one is called as um, NHEG meaning non homologous uh, end joining and homologous recombination right. So, this homologous recombination normally happens in the you know in the meiotic cells whereas, the this process we believe it happens in almost all the cells because here and there there could be damage and you know cell tries to repair itself. So, what it does is that this engineered nucleus we will come to that little later as what the nucleus is it is not something which can go and cut anywhere it is like more like the restriction enzyme that we discussed about almost this is the same that it recognize certain sequences right and then it goes and makes a double strand cut there just like restriction enzyme. And so, once you made a cut then our system in the it, it, it is whatever we are talking about is happening in the live cell. So, you are not extracting the DNA out. So, you are using a cell and we are introducing the nucleus and this will go and cut somewhere and as a result you have a DNA damage and our system tries to repair in that process you may delete some segment few bases that is good enough for a gene to be inactivated. So, if you have an enzyme which recognize certain sequence and that such kind of sequence is present over a gene or close to a gene which is likely to disturb the function you can use this and it, it makes the changes. So, this is the, um, the principle or the basic uh, um, concept behind uh, these nucleases let us see what they are. So, before we get into let us look into the, these two process one is called the non homologous end joining process and the homology directed repair or recombination what we discussed. Basically this is what you are talking about say suppose you have an enzyme which goes and makes a cut in your genome it could be a single cut or it could be a double cut depending on how many sites are there in a given segment of the genome. And then what happens in this process is once the cut is made our cell including human cells have the machinery to you know fix the damage because you know our cells are exposed to various <coughs> stress and some of them can cause DNA damage, but immediately our system makes sure that you know these damages are fixed and, and whatever we are talking about these proteins are nothing, but the proteins that are involved in repair process let us not worry about what is the name and what is the specific function, but there are two ways by which it can function. Say suppose you have a single cut then what happens is it tries to you know um, polish the DNA bit removes whatever it is and then tries to you know seal the DNA. In this process what happens is that there could be few additional bases added at the site of you know your the cut where it is made or it there could be few bases that are deleted. So, it is a kind of a random process it can be substitution it can be insertions it can be deletions. So, as a result you know you are going to have some change and some of them could affect the way the gene functions because it can change the coding region. So, therefore, the protein is not made you have lost few amino acids. So, it is basically altering the function of the gene, but what kind of changes will happen you do not have any control you expect that you know that would have some deleterious function of the gene which is more likely to be. The other process is that you have selected the enzyme such that or you have identified a gene with certain you know sequence such that the you know you have made two cuts. So, if you have two adjacent cuts cl close nearby then whatever the fragment that is lost in between that is sort of degraded. So, what the cell tries to do is the chromosomal DNA which is much larger now because small part is lost these two are joined together now inter in between whatever fragment that was there that is lost. So, as a result you are going to have a mutation which is more like a deletion say suppose a gene given exon say it is 2 kb and you have two sites you know which is separated by 2 kb fragment. If you cut then allow the system to repair you have lost the 2 kb in between and you have sealed it so therefore, the genes you know 2 exons or 1 exon whatever is lost. So, that is the way to do it. The other is more in the meiotic cell is this homology directed repair where basically the cell looks at regions that are sort of complementary uh, you know and then 
you are able to go on fix it. So, for example, you can you can have a construct kind of where you have region that are homologous, then it can go and try to stitch, identify that stitch it and so on. So, this is kind of a, you can create insertions using this method, but this is um, you know you cannot use it in all the cell types. So, depending on what you want to do. So, that is that is the um, concept behind this whole thing. Let us look into what is this nuclease, what are these nucleases people use for genome editing. First nuclease that, that people started using um, was like restriction enzyme as we said. So, we have um, you know a domain which is basically domain that is able to cleave the DNA just like a restriction enzyme. But restriction enzyme got two domains, one is the nucleus domain which helps the DNA to is the enzyme to cut the DNA. Then you have the other domain which gives the specificity as to where the enzyme should go and cut like as you have seen restriction enzyme they have a unique you know recognition sites a given site sequence are identified by an enzyme and it goes and cuts there. So, here too it is the same principle. So, you have a DNA binding which is the only difference here is that the recognition sites are pretty large like it could be 14 bases, 16 bases. Therefore, the frequency of such sites in your genome is very few right you know the probability that, that you would find that kind of a combination is very low. And therefore, it is not going to if you have used a smaller you know enzyme that identify a 4 base then it is going to chop off your genome that is not desirable because it, it does not allow the cell to survive. But here it is very few sites therefore, you are going to make cuts in only a few sites so that really helps right. So, one of the enzyme the earliest enzyme people have used is this uh, enzyme called FOK1 FOK1 and then of course, what they have done is they have deleted the DNA binding domain of that particular protein and then try to fuse it with some other you know uh, mm, uh, DNA binding protein therefore, you made an engineered enzyme. So, by doing this you can make this nucleus FOC1 to identify whichever sequence that you want right or you know you have much more um, uh, you know control over which segment it can go on cut. So, let us look into two such examples. One is what is called as uh, zinc finger nuclease, right? The other one is called as transcription activator like effector nuclease, okay? ZF1 is the abbreviation and TLN is the one. So, let us see what it is. Both use the same concept that you have a DNA binding domain which gives a site, site specificity, and then you have this nucleus domain which cuts very close to the domain. So, often this enzyme function as a dimer because you have one right and then you have the other one therefore, you know you can make two cuts and so on. So, that is what is shown here in figure. For example, it all started with the, the, the enzyme called meganucleases now that had limitation because it can cut only such sequence wherever it is there right. Then they have engineered such you know nucleus with what is called a zinc finger nucleus. Here the zinc finger is nothing but these are the structural domains that are present in many uh, transcription factors. So, you must have studied about transcription factor these are set of proteins that goes and identify certain sequence that are located on the promoter region of the gene. So, therefore, you can restrict which gene is turned on or turned off most often these are activators. So, these proteins go and bind to such sequences and then activate and most more often such sequences are present in, in a palindrome two domain you know two segments and they go as function as a dimer and so on. So, what they have done is they have used this DNA binding domain and they fused to uh, the nucleus domain such that you know uh, theoretically you have this segment identifying these sequences and then you have this nucleus domain. Likewise, you have another molecule of the same protein binds here and the nucleus domain it can make a cut wherever you want. So, it is not as simple what they have done is they have created large number of mutants for this zinc finger binding domain and such that they looked at what are the sequence on which it can bind. In fact, they can you know if you have a desired sequence then they can engineer the enzyme such that it will identify that sequence. So, what you have done is you decide where do you want to create the mutation and then create a DNA binding domain which can bind to that sequence you know that is the way now you can tailor. Uh, your enzyme to cut wherever you want. So, that kind of a you know uh, the system has evolved there are um, 
you know, now there are commercial companies which are specialized in making these enzymes. One of them is a Sigma Aldrich. So, what they do is that you give the sequence or they predict what sequence in the region that you want to delete and then they engineer the protein such that it will identify this sequence. There is a, you know, laborious process involved in it. The other one is very similar to zinc finger domain, but they have used uh, an enzyme, um, again not an enzyme, sorry, it is a transcription factor which are normally made by the pathogens that are uh, infecting um, plants. So, these are the pathogens that like our virus and others, they come and get into your system and then hijack your system. For example, virus can get into your uh, cell and then hijack, uh, use the same machinery of transcription, translation to make their own protein. The same way these are the protein that, that are made by the pathogen, but now hijack the system. So, they have used these, you know, uh, the genes that code for these proteins that are transcription activators to engineer genome, mainly the plant genome for example, what is shown here is a plant genome. So, again the concept is very similar, you have here DNA binding domain fused to the nucleus domain and you can engineer such that whichever sequence that you want more or less you will be able to cleave over there. So, the basically you make this protein and then deliver. So, you make the protein to get into the cell and express there, right. And then once the protein is there is going to cleave that uh, region of the DNA and you know if such kind of cuts are made then the cell tries to repair in this process as we discussed little earlier there may be loss, there may be gain, there can be alterations as a result the function of the gene is lost right. And then you allow the plants to grow and look at the desired phenotype in case of plants, in case of animals or cell lines likewise you can do that you know you can go for for example the embryonic stem cells you can introduce these nucleus there, if something is happening you, you know, look at the cell whether desired changes happened. If it has happened then go and create the animal, so it is going to have such kind of changes. So, this is another robust method because you are not really looking at all those constructs that we discussed. So, the time spent in making constructs, you know, you no longer really have to do. You can engineer the nucleus and introduce into the, the cell, it will do the rest of the things. So, it becomes much more. Uh, easier and more efficient as compared to the knockout that we discussed. But again, this is a global thing, so it is not conditional, right? So, that is the another process. But the more recent um, development in genome editing is this what is called as CRISPR Cas9 mediated genome modifications, and this has come up in a huge way because uh, it uses a very different kind of thing. So, in fact, you can now you know the previous the two ZF1 and uh, the other one that we spoke about. So, there you are dependent on a protein whose binding domain dictates as to where the cut can happen. So, you know you have to think of certain sequence onto which you, you know you, you know your protein goes and binds and there could be complications at times because the sequence could be such that you know you, you are unable to get a DNA binding domain for that particular sequence. The complexity makes it uh, uh, of the genome where do you want to mutate can at times uh, limit your efficiency with which you are able to generate such mutants of DNA binding domain. So, you may not be able to get them. So, that is a limitation because you have to screen a large number of mutants at times it does not work out. So, this CRISPR Cas9 really uh, does not bother about such DNA binding domain, right. So, before you get into let us see what is this system is and from where we evolved such kind of engineered nucleases. So, basically just like we have a immune system in our body where we have you know um, cells that fight against any foreign um, you know uh, bacterium or virus that gets in. The bacteria also has an immune system and this Cas9 is one such system which prevents the entry of for example, any foreign DNA bacteriophage for example, because this is they infect the bacterium and, and they or some other viruses can introduce a DNA. So, they want to be immune uh, and identify such DNA and remove them, right. So, this is pretty much that is that is the mechanism that it uses. This is called as clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeat pretty long sequence, but what it says is you have segments in the genome of the bacterium in which there are palindromic sequences. The palindrome is that you have for example, A, B, C, D this is a sequence and then 
it would be reversed for example, C B A right that is that is the palindrome right. Now, such kind of short sequence palindromic sequence are clustered meaning present close to each other, but these are interspaced meaning they are not continuous, but there are other sequence in between. And such sequence really help in you know fight against the metastasis. So, therefore, it is called as you know the abbreviation of this cluster regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats is called as CRISPR and then you have you know genes that are associated with this cluster right CRISPR associated therefore, they are called as CAS9 right. So, whatever CAS genes that is what it is. So, how does it work? So, you have what is shown here is a bacterial genome and then you have this CAS9 gene and then close to uh, that you have these you know the clusters right and, and the idea is that you know wherever you have this uh, the clusters then RNA is produced and the RNA really helps as a surveillance it goes and looks for any foreign DNA if it is then it, it gets degraded how does it do that. So, as in when a foreign DNA comes in because of an infection what happens is that this system really takes part of the DNA and, and sort of integrates as part of you know the bacterial genome around this clusters okay. it puts that just like your immune cells if there are any foreign body gets in it you know you in your your immune cells attacks them digest the protein and presence presence part of this protein in your MHC complex right. Therefore, the system is alerted as to these are the peptide that possibly are present as a foreign invader exactly the same way. And then this cluster is activated therefore, the transcripts are made the transcripts are such that you have this you know um, fragments along with the foreign DNA sequences. So, what happens is this RNA goes and looks for homology and wherever you have a DNA which is homologous to just that has got incorporated now it is going to you know degrade that you know uh, cut that DNA and, and, and then try to degrade this is what this is how it is done. So, in, in other words you are going to cut a DNA whose sequence matches the RNA that the Cas9 gene regulates right and this, this is basically uh, or this this CRISPR locker regula regulates so like what is shown here. So, you have a primary transcripts right which are made and then they have this uh, region and this is what is called a CRRNA and if wherever it finds an homology and it is going to cut ok. So, this is how it is. So, this is to protect against any invader that comes into the bacterium. So, let us see how we have engineered that you know complex a mechanism to our own advantage therefore, we can edit our genome the way we want it. So, there are two ways by which we can do um, this is the first one that are shown on the left side is genome engineering with Cas9 nuclease again it is a you know a nucleus because it cuts the DNA. What is the difference between this and the ZFN nucleus that we had discussed earlier. So, over there the nucleus is dependent on a DNA binding domain to identify a sequence where it has to cut here the nucleus is dependent on the RNA that comes along with, with the system therefore, the RNA would look for homology for that particular RNA sequence wherever in the genome you have it is going to cut it. This is the RNA that is shown here and what we can do is we can engineer the RNA such that you put a small segment of the sequence which is complementary to the genome where do you want to make the cut ok. So, if you make the Cas9 complex along with the RNA which is called as a guide RNA because it really helps the nucleus to go and home where it should cut. So, now if you want for example, gene X I want to cut. So, I take part of that sequence that is uh, in a critical region of gene X and make that RNA then it is going to go and position the nucleus around gene X right. So, then it can of course, the nucleus it makes a double strand cut exactly the same way that you made and then allow the same mechanism. So, your cell is able to repair either by you know um, the non homologous end joining or the other homology directed repair. So, in this process either you can delete a region or you can put in a new sequence like you know insertion. So, the same approach that we discussed earlier this is just to either delete or create a mutation or to introduce a small segment into the genome. 
But you can also just like the way we discussed in the other two nucleases which has got DNA binding domain, you can also engineer such that you have two complex that of the Cas9 which sit close to each other in a segment of the genome because you can design the guide RNA such that it, it, it falls very close to each other in the genome. And, and then what happens? It, it cuts these are mutants of this uh, Cas9 um, uh, which are called a Nikase. Now, it does not make a double stranded cut, but it just you know cuts one strand of the DNA right. These are mutants that are derived. As a result what happens? Now, again your system tries to you know because of the nicks that are created intervening sequence is not last. Then you can again put a new homology directed repair mechanism you can it can help you to integrate your foreign DNA because it pretty much looks for the homology. So, it would only put the DNA where such nicks are made. So, it gets in and you can create the kind of sequence. So, for example, you want to fix a repair uh, you know fix a error in the DNA there was a mutation and you want to rectify the mutation put back into the wild type. So, you can use this approach and therefore, you know this new DNA can go and sort of fix this. So, this is doable in this process you can correct the error right. So, this CRISPR Cas9 has become so powerful that you know within a few years of uh, you know introducing the system you will find that its application. This is one of the papers that came about two years back which talks about right from human cells to you can see that there are few examples here human cells to mouse, rat, rabbit, frog, zebra fish and what not from plants to bacterium to yeast you know you are able to edit the genome the way you want. So, it is very very you know uh, robust technique and wide applicability and, and, and all you need is your sequence of the genome because you want to create a guide RNA that is good enough. So, since now we have discussed there are so many uh, species whose you know DNA has been sequenced it is much easier for us to really do such kind of uh, editing. So, it really helps. So, it is not only restricted to the, the you know the cell lines or animals. In fact, very recently last month in November 2016 the first attempt to fix a mutation leading to a particular kind of cancer in this case it is a lung cancer in a human uh, case was uh, sort of approved a Chinese group really used to this approach. The approach is to uh, take the cells from the human body and fix the error and put back the cells therefore, you know you are able to control this. So, we need to wait and see how good this approach is, but it the promise is uh, you know is enormous and people are thinking that if really works out and if it has the kind of specificity that we are talking about it should be able to fix the genome the way we want and it could be a powerful therapeutic uh, potential this particular approach has got. So, that is uh, you know uh, uh, that is that sort of brings an end to um, this lecture and then we will see the rest of the technologies that help us in editing the genome in our next lecture. Yeah.